Greetings there, wherever you may be. There is, or has been, a British movie doing the rounds. One you may have seen, or at least got wind of, Wicked Little Letters. It's a quirky comedy set in an English town in the 1920s, in which a series of anonymous and obscene letters start turning up in people's letterboxes. The hunt is on to find the poison pen writer. A great premise for a movie of this kind, moi thinks. That's because it's loosely based on real events, nor were English seaside towns this era alone when it came to scandalous letters being dropped into letterboxes by writer unknown. A small mining town in New Zealand's South Island would also be in the grips of a series of unsigned threatening letters in the 1930s. In a more sinister twist that paints wicked little letters in a rather tame light, that writer would go on to commit murder, inspire other Kiwis to have a crack before he or she even made it to court themselves. This is in fact three intertwined stories in one. Then my brief one to follow lastly at the end as well. Let's go back to Black Ball, West Coast in 1934. It's been two decades since I stayed in Black Ball, not visited, that stayed. Spent a couple of entertaining nights at the Black Ball Inn, across the road from the Working Men's Club. Wikipedia now puts the population of this West Coast town at 400 odd. Those numbers were far greater when I'm talking here in this podcast, a podcast which is available on all major podcast platforms, I must add. Back then, there was a coal mine operating. There were 1,200 souls. Black Ball also had a railway connecting through to Greymouth and places further afar. Commercially, the block on Hilton Street, with the fab general store, Salami Outfit, which I'll get to at the end, was a far more happening place when all this occurred. Hotels galore. There was also a butchery, a bakery and drapery on the same main street. And they burnt down in the 50s apparently. The block across the road, you would find the post office. Black Ball was at its peak. It was the start of a new week on September the 24th, 1934. A parcel arrives at the Black Ball post office addressed to Ethel Bragg and Jean Clark. The local posties didn't have far to go. They worked together across the road in the drapery. The excited pair opened the mystery delivery to find it contained a box of chocolates resplendent with a red ribbon, a cryptic note signed Jim. The only Jim known to the pair was the cousin of Clark, James Clark, and he worked right next door at the butchery. Why would his note say, We'll see you and Tommy at Nahiri Downs next Saturday. The first three to tuck into the assortment inside the drapery were Ethel Bragg, Jean Clark, and the wife of the owner, Mrs McGregor. She thought the one she was consuming had a rather bitter taste like a laxative, half chewed hers before discarding it. On closer examination, the chockies did look a wee bit manky, past their use-by date, with small imperfections. Being in the tail of the world's largest depression, though, folk were less fussy. Eating old stock and taking your chances wasn't out of the ordinary. They tucked in and popped next door to thank James for his surprise gift. If it was him who'd sent the box, he denied it, before scoffing at two for good measure. Margaret Smith, who worked next door at Dumpleton's Bakery, caught wind of all the reverie. She knew both Bragg and Clark, and they were in a generous mood, and she took her chance to dig into the treat then scooted back to her job as a customer entered the bakery, told Mr Dumpleton about the laughter and what was happening, and he too shot next door to grab one. The publican of the club hotel, Mr McGregor, also took his chances as well, not without the odd comment on occasion about the peculiar sour taste. 16 of the 41 chocolates were consumed. This Monday morning revelry came to a quick, dramatic end. 30 minutes after the box was opened, Margaret Smith had vomited, collapsed and gone into convulsions inside the bakery, was carried to Mr Dumpleton's house and the local GP was called. There was nothing he could do. Margaret Smith was dead at 21. Others had also fallen ill, although not seriously. The source of the ills were all too clear. The chocolates were to blame. 
And this wasn't just a case of food poisoning. It was deliberate. Local police and detectives were imported in from Christchurch and they had a murder and two attempted murders on their hands. Upon testing it was discovered five of the chocolates consumed had likely contained strychnine crystals, ten of the untouched chocolates as well. This case wouldn't be an easy one to crack though. Were Bragg and Clark the sole intended targets? Did the sender think sending chocolates to this vivacious pair would result in them unintendedly spreading mayhem in the community? Who would have hated people in town that much? They wanted to see them dead? What was the motive? The evidence they had in terms of chocolates led nowhere. It was a common brand on sale up and down the west coast and around the country. Ditto the poison. Strychnine was widely used to reduce populations of rabbits and rodents. Every second rural house had some or similar. Their major hopes hinged on someone identifying the writing on the chocolates. They would shortly have more written evidence to hone into. Shored up their thinking, this was a local. When the police found out this wasn't the first time either Ethel Bragg or Jean Clark had heard from the poster of the chocolates, they had previously also received mysterious and ominous letters out of the blue. These had been intercepted by their respective mothers. Other people had come forward, men and women, to say they had received these strange profanity-laden letters. Sometimes the rantings were about themselves or their friends or family members. It was all rather odd meaning most people didn't take them seriously and threw them into the fire, and sometimes unopened once everyone knew who the writer was. From the one saved and retrieved, yep, it was the same person. The breakthrough came via the post office clerk. He reported he'd received unwanted attention from one of the locals, pestering him about the progress in the case, how he'd like to string up the perpetrator. His behaviour, though, it was rather over the top, unhinged at times. As he got to see all the letters departing Blackpool, the murder package, he thought the bloke's writing looked fairly similar. Indeed, 36-year-old gold miner John Page was well known as an eccentric loner who lived in a hut five kilometres from town. On the tip of many a tongue, four months after the murder, the police went rattling through his hut Page told the police he knew he killed Smith and gave them the name of another miner, then suggested, for good measure, it was the postmaster, denied even knowing a clerk or brag, yet when asked about the victim, Smith, yes, yes, I knew her. Through prior investigations, the police renew really that was the other way round. He'd pestered both Clark and Begg in the past. Page's calligraphy also told a different story. His writing was identical to all the letters and what was on the chocolates. John Page was now facing a charge of murder. The distinct possibility his neck was about to be lengthened. A preliminary hearing was set. In between that and the arrest and the hearing, though, the police were forced to concede the English immigrant wasn't the full quid. He went from jail to the psych unit till he was finally a judge fit enough to go in front of a court in July 1935. Those proceedings were blighted by Page's unhinged outburst, what the court reporter called peculiar behaviour. The jury considered him insane, unfit to plead. He was committed to Seacliff Mental Hospital in Dunedin in 1935. Not entirely sure what happened to him after he was treated, other than he died in Auckland in 1953. Now, before you think that was a bit of a fizzer, Page's sneaky plan to fool his targets into taking the bait in the form of random boxes of chocolates was merely a one-off by a nutcase. Wait, there's more. Other Kiwis with nefarious intentions heard about this method of dispatching people who pissed them off, took the baton and ran with it. Would end up in court even before Page himself on occasion. I did tell you this was a three stories for the price of one, plus a personal little side story about my last day at Blackpool at the very end. Let's travel to Hastings, east coast of the North Island. In the court at the end of August, charged with attempted murder, was Phyllis Marshall, her co-conspirator, 
was Jack Masters, the intended victim, Al McKeith. This was a messy love triangle. Jack Marshall was working on his father's farm. The old man disapproved of his relationship with Phyllis Marshall, threatened to cut him out of his will, thus the farm, if he ever married her. Jack was told to aim higher. Al McKeith is the right lass for you, my lad. Jack was already dating both Phyllis and Alma. He was banging Alma. Jack concocted a plan to take Phyllis out of the equation. Just bear in mind, by the time it all got to court, their respective defence lawyers were both painting their clients as a minor player. Marshall purchased the chocolates and have a form of arsenic to insert into it. He loosely told Phyllis of his plan and for her to post the chocolates, thus at the time not implicating himself directly. Then he had second thoughts, raced round to Key's household, only to find her mum had opened the mysterious box, smelt a rat and taken them to the police. Jack Masters' defence was he was just trying to frighten her. Phyllis Marshall's was it was all Jack's plan and she just went along for the ride. Unlike the Black Ball case, the writing was ambiguous and couldn't be pinned conclusively to either party. More likely her, not him. The jury couldn't conclude who was telling the truth and who was lying. They both walked free of attempted murder. Well, not entirely free. Phyllis Marshall was caught lying in court and she got probation for that. Number three. If this podcast is the first time in ages you've heard the Christian name Alma and the pesticide is strychnine, you're in for a treat here. Down in Blenheim, South Island, in another case, a mother of two, Alma Rose, received sweets in the mail, an accompanying sweetheart note. Having read up about Black Ball, she twigged immediately as to the danger posed by such tempting anonymous gifts. She was right to be suspicious. Police tests came back. They were loaded with a strychnine with direct parallels to the case 300 kilometres south. Once the Blenheim police had ruled out the hubby, they were left scrambling for a motive. Who would want to target a housewife? They then focused on the writing to see if that could be traced to someone. And they immediately got a hit. It was familiar to... Wait for it. Alma Rose... When the police accused her of staging the whole thing, she folded, admitted it was a cry for attention, for which she was sentenced to 12 months on good behaviour. And that's the ending of all the confectionery poisoning going on in New Zealand in 1934-35. Busy old time in crime. Now let me tell you about my side story about Black Bull. How on reflection, and with the aid of Google, I worked out when I last spent time there, and that turned out to be a 2009. You know why I was able to work out that date fairly precisely. The two best known establishments in Black Ball are the Hilton Pub, the salami and small goods outfit called Black Ball Salami. I'd left a large gap in my bag to bring back some of their products. There was just one slight problem. The place was closed. It turns out the owner had just bumped off his wife Still in the clink as at publishing of this podcast? There you have it, fine individuals who have dedicated 15 odd minutes of their lifespans listening to my latest podcast. I'm quietly confident on your deathbed you'll look back to these seconds being marginally better than the investment, say, of listening to the heinous banshee called Taylor Swift. Mind you, miles below listening to Bowie in his Berlin period. I will spot you next time. Bye for now.